about uh, they mentioned that I was here today or good to see me or I'm wandering or something. But uh, I'm looking for something. I said, yeah, I came to church here today. I can't wait to hear what the preacher has to say. <laughs> Um, it's great to be here, and I, as I mentioned to the adult Bible class, um, the Lord speaks to me too. When I preach, I prepare what a blessing that is, but when I preach, I'm serious. I, I, sometimes I wait to hear what he has to say to me, because yeah. he speaks to my heart too. And that's beautiful. I love that and I appreciate that. Well, I'd like to um, thank you for the opportunity and thank Keith, Pastor Keith and Beverly for this opportunity to be with you. I uh, Just real quick, I'm not trying to beat my own drum, but um, I have fond connections with Valley Vista Community Church. I've been here a number of times and preached here a number of times. It goes way back to when the church began several years ago, and the connections there. And so that's a beautiful story, a nice story in itself. But um, as I was driving here today, I was thinking, you know, it's wonderful to see people gathering here and there on Sunday morning, going to church. Of course, me, uh, to not go to church is very foreign on a Sunday morning. It seems like I'm out of my element if I'm not church on Sunday morning, obviously. And I drove by a smaller church, and then I drove by a pretty good sized church. Uh, on the way here this morning, I thought, Sunday mornings are great. And I look forward to them because I'm with family, I'm with those that maybe I don't know so well, but they're searching or looking or first time in a church or checking it out or things like that. And what a blessing that is. Sometimes people end up in church because they've been kind of coerced to be there for one reason or another. Come with a grandpa or come with this or that or come because of this or that. But it's wonderful because the Lord speaks to our hearts and deals with us all for His glory and our good and the good of society. The society that needs the Lord. And I, I remember the story of uh, at the church that I attend quite a bit in Kingman, Central Kingman. We have a celebrate recovery group, pretty good sized group that meets on Friday nights. And then uh, there are other ministries similar to that. I remember a young boy who was uh, probably about 18 or 19, struggling with some issues in his life, wasn't sure about a lot of things, especially spiritual things, the Lord, the Bible, etc. And he uh, <coughs> was asked to go to a certain home study group, study group. He said, okay, I'll go. But they pulled up, and he refused to get out of the car. No, I'm not, not going to do it. I'm not going to go. Well, they finally got him inside. And wouldn't you know that the Lord got a hold of his heart, and he went off to Bible college. You know? Just had this desire to serve God and go in that direction. Well, I'm going to pray. And uh, I want you to remember what's going on over in the Middle East, that situation. Pray for that. And uh, pray that uh, Keith and Bev will have a great time with their family down in the Tucson area and have a safe trip back. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful for that. And uh, with Keith comes a tree prong ministry. Lisa did this time, adult class, 
Sunday service here, and then Sunday service at Whitecliffs, assisted living, mm -hmm. two o'clock. Yes. So that's a, a privilege. Yes. Let me lead us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us, for the joy of serving you, for the privilege of gathering together in this church with these dear people to encourage one another, says to provoke each other to love and to good works, to fellowship, to pray, have communion together, look in the Word together, to realize that we are on mission. And Lord God, we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for Pastor Keith and his wife Beverly. I ask you to bless them and keep them and give them a great time with their family and all the experiences down south. Please bring them back safely to us. Watch over them. Give them strength for each day. And Lord, we pray for the brethren, for those in Israel, for the leadership, for decisions that are being made, for their protection, for the demise of the enemy that is bringing such pain and hurt upon that nation and upon others, including Americans. Lord, we thank you for your promises to us in the scriptures, knowing that Israel is a focal point of what you are doing. So we just pray for them and lift them up. Those that are hurting, those that are injured, those that have lost loved ones, those that are wondering where they are, what's going on. Guide and direct and help. And guide our United States of America for right leadership to make right directions and decisions and all that should be done. We thank you, we love you, we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One other thing, I do have another pair of glasses here. And I told the adult class that I was struggling in that age of my life where I think I need to make another adjustment in the glasses. <laughs> I might put these on, or see which ones do I have on that? Okay. So how are you doing today? God loves you. We love you. We love each other. We care for each other. One thing I pray about on Sunday mornings when I'm at our church, and one reason you never see my wife, I'm trying to remember what she looks like. <laughs> so, is it, she, she helped run our coffee shop in the church down there, so she's real involved in all that stuff. But anyway, is that we are privileged to be here and to be with you folks. And thank you. And I trust God's blessing upon you and upon what is said today. I love quotes. Whenever I read it, first thing I do when I get a new book to read is I take about two or three, three or five cards and put in there because I'm always taking notes and I write down catchy quotes and I have stacks, just cards stacked with all these quotes. The ones that grab you can say a lot in just a line or two. The best test of my Christian growth and of my love of Christ occurs in the mainstream of life, not in the quietness of my study or in the quietness of my devotions. So the real test of my Christian growth and love is out there with people. And so I was saying that I always pray on Sunday mornings that as I mingle with the people as they're coming to the services, 
Do they come in to sit down? I shake hands with them, talk to them, give them a hug, whatever. I pray that God will make me sensitive to those that have a special need. Where they maybe need to talk a little more than just saying, oh, I'm okay, or fine, or hello, or, you know. And God does lead me that way. Because I'll, I'll walk up to one and shake hands, and how are you doing? Oh, fine, great, good to see you. How are things going fine? Doing the next one. But then I'll be stopped in my tracks at times, and I'll say, I remember this middle adult woman, she looked new to the church. I didn't recognize her. I shook her hand and introduced myself. And, how are you doing? Well, I'm fine. Good. Okay. I said, how are things really going? And I sat down. She started to cry. She started to talk to me a little more about what was really going on. I remember the time that as a young pastor in our denomination, this is years ago, I've been in Kingman a little over 44 years, and the reason I came to Kingman originally, our family, was the pastor at church. So that happened and all that. But I was at one of our denominational pastors' conferences, district conferences, over in uh, uh, Southern California, or something, it was at Riverside at that time. Anyway. And I was kind of the new boy in the block. I was new with the denomination. I was a new pastor here in Kingman. I went to the pastor's conference over there. And all the pastors are huddling together. And how are you doing? How's your church doing? They're comparing notes. And our church is this big and this big and this big. And we're doing this and that and the other. And I didn't really know. You know, I, I was just learning to know them fellow pastors and all. But there was one pastor that I didn't know, uh, had known him for quite a while, and he was there. And so I was in the back, and we're getting ready for this big, huge session together before we went into groups or whatever. And there were probably maybe 150 of us, or I don't know, something like that. And Pastor Don, I said, Dennis, come up here and sit with me. Uh, okay. And do you know that, that just that one person saying that one thing to me, showing a little extra concern, instead of me just wandering in the back and sitting down back in the back and I didn't know part of anybody, he said, come up here and sit with me. Boy, that, that touched me. Touched my life. A little rain can straighten a flower. A little love can change a life. Mm -hmm. And I want to speak about the impact that you and I can have on other people on more of an individual basis. How we shouldn't shortchange, so to speak, ourselves and how wherever you are, whoever you are, the impact you can have on somebody else by sometimes some brief encounter or brief gesture, a hug, a word, a handshake, an invitation, how you can touch someone else's life and, on top of that, do that for the glory of God in their journey coming to Christ or walking with Christ or whatever it might be. Now I've got a family situation coming up that I've yet to encounter, but it will be in the next few days, no doubt. And I know my grandson is wondering how his grandfather is going to respond to him <laughs> in this situation. But I'm just going to love on him and be there for him, and be that person in his life to encourage him and help him along. I love this song, and well, I like those songs we sang today, a couple of the older ones, but the way we got going with that person, I thought I'd be rolling in the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> 
an introduction was what? <laughs> but that was good. I like that. I like those songs. We need it sang. And I don't know if you know that Dave's trying to. He's harmonizing in these. You were harmonizing. Yeah. I can get that. Yeah, I heard that. Tenor harmony. Yeah. <laughs> Make me a blessing. That's an old. Anybody remember that hymn? Make me a blessing. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry sorrowing glad. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Give us what was given to you in your need. Love as the master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Unto your mission be true. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing. Out of my life may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh Savior divine. Make me a blessing today. There are a few things that really stand out in my own personal life that I've learned, I believe in, I live. One, of course, is the Word of God, the Bible. The Word of God, how precious it is. It stood the testings of centuries. They tried to get rid of it. It's still here. One of the best known, most popular books that's ever been written. Written by man, authored by God, the inspired Word of God from beginning to end. Now I remember my first encounter with a Bible. That was in Klamath Falls, Oregon. I was in, I was trying to recall, either the fifth or sixth grade, in the school, in the building. Yeah. We lined up, the Gideons were down here. <laughs> And they gave us all a Gideon's New Testament, one by one as we walked by them. In the school. And boy, I'm still alive. <laughs> I still have my family and everybody. And then, for Christmas one year, my mother wanted to get me a Bible. She asked my good friend, this is, I think I was a junior or senior in high school. And so she helped, or he helped her pick out a Bible for me. So that was my first full Bible. And then I went to the New Schofield Reference Bible and the New American Standard and on and on. But the Word of God has stood there with me, has never failed me. Another thing is salvation. I received Christ as my Savior. I gave my life to Him. He's been a precious reality all along the way. Precious reality. A third thing is the realization that today's society is all messed up. But God is in control. God is sovereignly, ultimately in control. Another thing is that the realization that my early aspirations as I got out of the Navy and went to Bible college and seminary and all, I now to change the world. And I wanted to do big things for God and be there where I should be. But then I found out and realized later on that if I'm going to do that, I've got to change my world and be glorifying to God and faithful to Him in my world. When all of us do that, it will change the world. Yeah. So I, I'm not able to change the whole world. But if I'm faithful to change my world, for I am, then it can have an impact as we all do that on the whole world. And that's one reason I want to speak on that subject today, is that you can have an impact on other people. You don't, it doesn't matter your education, what color house you live in, what car you drive. It doesn't matter if you have a motorcycle or not. But 
I love motorcycles. Yeah. But um, anyway, none of that matters. It's you being a person, who you are, the reality of who you are, just being willing to say, God, just use me in someone else's life. I'm available. And being there for them. The power of one, the power of one person. I remember, and I'm just about finished with the introduction, then we'll get to the sermon. Yeah. <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> For a while I taught junior high math in Keeneland, the old junior high in Detroit. And one thing interesting about junior hires is their physical, emotional maturation levels and speed. I mean, they're so different. I remember looking down the hall in junior high during class breaks, the teacher is supposed to stand outside the door, help do a little crowd control from all the students are changing classes. So I'm looking down the hallway, and I see two girls walking down the hall, among other people. But I, these two stood out because one was so much taller than the other. One looked about like a fifth grader or so. The other looked like she was 18 or 19 or 20. That's how different they but it has happened to me that I would teach them and then not see that student, one of those students, for a few years. Now, I didn't change that much, a little bit, but not much. So they come up and to me and say, hey, Mr. Colby, do you remember me? And man, three or four or five years makes a lot of difference to those in that age level <laughs> as they get older. And one girl, in, I was in Walmart or somewhere, and she came up and said, Mr. Colby, I want to thank you for changing my life, for the impact you made on me. I didn't remember. I don't know what I said or did or whatever it was. But I am thankful that I was able to be used of God in that way. And I am reminded, as I was thinking about this message, of Barnabas, Barnabas, one of the Christians then, it says in Acts chapter 4, I believe it is, that he sold some land and put it at the apostles' feet, it says, as they shared things together, as the church was starting to grow and as the, the Jewish Christian community was growing. Those that were following Jesus, the way, persecutions coming upon them, the, 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 the mission uh, and message is going out through Peter and others to the Gentiles, and then it's starting to move geographically, bringing in those that weren't Jews into the Christian church and how they had to deal with that issue. but soon realize that God's, God's uh, proclamation of salvation is the same for all of them. You know, repentance by faith through grace, you know. And so what happened was, you know, G, or not Jesus, but Saul, uh, the Lord got a hold of him as he was on the road to Damascus to get a bunch of Christians that were following this person that were part of what they called the way, the Christian group that was growing, and to bring them back for persecution to Jerusalem. I remember the Lord got a hold of him and, and cast him down and blinded him temporarily as he was, as Saul was on the way to Damascus, and he ended up at the house of Ananias. And um, Ananias ministered to him and uh, Acts chapter 9. And then he received his sight again. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul started preaching. His name shifted from Saul to Paul. And then in Acts chapter 11, I want to pick up at verse 19. I'm just reading out a New Living Translation now. But it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, Meanwhile, this is as the church was growing and 
the Gentiles are being saved. The believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, because they stoned Stephen, Stephen stood up for Christ, and they stoned him, and that persecution, and Christians were leaving, and it was, the church is growing. Uh, after Stephen's death, uh, the believers traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. Antioch was north of, kind of north and west of Jerusalem up there. Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the non-Jews about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles or non-Jews believed and turned to the Lord. When the church that was at Jerusalem, which was basically Jewish people, heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch to see what was going on. So from that hub in Jerusalem, which church coming to the Jews and now it's starting to spread out to the non-Jews out in these other areas, the church is going to grow and spread out and later on, Paul goes on his missionary journeys. But they sent Barnabas up to Antioch to find out what's really going on here. When he arrived, he saw this evidence of God's blessing. He was filled with joy. And he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Now Barnabas was a good man, strong in faith, full of the Holy Spirit. Many people were brought to the Lord. Now listen to this. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. Now Saul's the one that was saved. Ananias ministered to him. He was at Damascus in Jerusalem. Then he went down to Tarsus. So Barnabas went up to Antioch and he said, I've got to get Saul. I'm going to go down and get Saul and bring him up here with me. So he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians. The point being that Barnabas said, I'm going to go find Saul. He's that one that persecuted the Christians, that Jewish man. Now he knows Christ himself. He's a believer. I've encouraged the believers at Jerusalem to accept him. Now he's down at Troas, or Tarsus, and I'm going to go get him and bring him back to be in Antioch with me while I minister to these younger believers and teach them. I want Saul, also Paul, right there with me so he can be encouraged, so he can learn, he can watch what's happening. What, what a, how significant is that? That Barnabas, God said to Barnabas, go get Saul, take him back. Bring him back up here and encourage him and let him see what you're doing. Let him help you, let him grow, let him learn as you minister to these new believers up in Antioch, a ways above, up the coast, up the coast from Gaza. Huh. Anyway. So the Lord used him that way. And the, the whole point of this is that if we are available, God can use us one by one in other people's lives. Now, when I was young, everything was in boxes. When I was a young preacher, young pastor, we did evangelism this way. When people came to church, they dressed this way. When I visited them in their homes, their homes should look like this. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just kind of in boxes and restricted. But after a few years, the Lord just broke those boxes down and said, that's not the thing. People can look this way, that way, their house can be this way, that way. Evangelism can be done this way, it can be done that way, it can be done that way. All these different and God started to show me the beauty of individual people. 
and of ministering to them. And I used to think, well, if I'm going to be a good evangelist, a good preacher, a witness, I've got to take that person, I've got to get them over here against the wall. If I'm going to witness to them the right way, I've got to pull out my four spiritual laws, my little book, but I've got to pin them against the wall and read it to them and press them for an answer right there. Otherwise, I haven't been a good evangelist. I haven't been a good witness. I used to think that. Well, then I learned that God uses us in different ways. This way, that way, the other way. And when we have it in our heart, that not only would we genuinely love them and care for them, but we we're concerned about their salvation too, or wherever they are in their walk with the Lord. Then maybe God's just going to use me in this, this short way, or this brief way at that point, or that way, or that way. Maybe it's someone that walks in the door of the church. They've never been here before. And it just so happens people are closer here talking, closer there, and you see them, and you want to make sure that they feel welcome. You go back and introduce yourself, shake their hand, etc. Or it could be down at the golf course. You're in the, the restaurant, and the lady comes up with a little girl. Does she still help? Wait on the table. Anyway, come up, and not only do they help you and wait on you, but you say, how are you doing? Or how's the family? Or what's going on? Or wherever it is, a neighbor or whatever, just showing them that love and just being used in that way at that point, time, that moment. God wants to use us all that way. And in my life, God has used, I, I can think of many people, but five in particular, in a specific way God used to just bring me along. But it says here, let me just read that. Uh, we're getting close to the end. <laughs> just uh, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church. Barnabas went, he looked for, and he brought him back. Now there are times when we're in situations where we can just walk by people, or we can just let it go and think, nah, I'll bother with it today. But other times, maybe those times, we should say, I'm going to do it. I've got a neighbor, great young guy. And he's having a few struggles right now. He's a young adult man. But um, in our neighborhood, we kind of lease a few houses, help each other out by taking each other's trash cans in. You take that big green trash can, roll it out to the street, and leave it there, at least in the kingdom. Um, and then you have to roll it back for next year house. So I always take his trash can in. Um, his wife doesn't have to do it. He, he's at work, and if I get home and they're out there, I'll take, you know, take his in and all that stuff. But I trust that one of these days it's going to make a real difference. Now, I'm not out there witnessing to him fully. I uh, began some steps, but anyway, God using us in a beautiful way. And you are important. If everybody just encouraged someone else, and this church is growing, and it's beautiful, I love it out here. It's growing, growing, growing. And we want it to grow more and other people to be touched. But let me close by telling you a story and if you're a teacher, you've probably heard this. A uh, professional, teacher by profession. But anyway, it's the story of Teddy. Anybody heard the story of Teddy? Okay. I'll kind of uh, paraphrase it to tell it. The story goes that Mrs. Thompson 
who received her fifth grade class, beginning of the year. And um, as a teacher, Mrs. Thompson, of course, like all teachers, don't, didn't have any favorites in her class. But yet, well, we'll see. She noticed one student named Teddy that uh, just was kind of a recluse to himself. He wasn't always dressed so well, didn't, didn't always smell so well. Well, as a beginning of the year, a teacher, she was supposed to go through the files of the students and just get a little better understanding of them. So she was reading through Teddy's file. And uh, the first grade teacher said, Teddy's a bright student, doing great. Everybody loves him. He's always helpful. On and on. Second grade teacher's notes about Teddy was, Teddy's a, a good student. He's having some struggles at home. His mother is not doing so well. She's terminally ill. Third grade teacher entry, and it went up. Teddy's not doing so well. Uh, Teddy's mother died. Uh, his father doesn't seem to be too helpful. And uh, so she had Teddy in class, and when she read this, she realized, and she just cried about Teddy and about the attitude she had with him, because she kept marking his papers. She didn't feel bad about putting the big red check mark or, mark or F on there for flunk and uh, stuff like that until she read about Teddy and really realized that he lost his mother and all that. And uh, she was ashamed, cried, and Teddy became very special to her. Christmas came. All the students brought gifts for Mrs. Thompson that last day before Christmas break. Gifts wrapped in pretty paper and pretty bows and all that stuff. And then she noticed Teddy's gift. It was wrapped in kind of a, a paper bag type wrapping, the old brown paper bag. It didn't look so well. And she opened the gifts and everybody's watching and she's ooing and aahing about the gifts that the students had gotten her. She opened Teddy's gift and it was a bracelet with some of the, the sparkly beads missing and a bottle of perfume that was partly gone. And she kind of, the students laughed and kind of made fun of it. She tried to push, blush it over, you know, to smooth over that. But when everybody left that day, Teddy came up to her and said, Mrs. Thompson, do you like the gift I got you? That was my mother's bracelet. Mm -hmm. And that perfume was hers. Mm -hmm. And she said, Teddy, I love it. Mm -hmm. And she made over Teddy the rest of that year. And Teddy started straightening up and doing better and with his grades and everything. And so the year ended. And Teddy, at the end of the year, wrote a note, gave it to her, slipped it under her door. Said, Mrs. Thompson, I want to thank you for this year. And you're the best teacher I've ever had. Well, about six years passed by, and she got another note from Teddy. And said, Mrs. Thompson, I want you to know that I finished high school and I was third in my class. And it was a good experience and I still want you to know that you were the best teacher I ever had. And then four years more went by and she got another note from Teddy. Teddy said, I felt compelled that I should go on to college. And I graduated at the top of my class. Mrs. Thompson, I want you to know you were the best teacher I ever had. And then about four years later went by, and she got another note from Teddy. Teddy said, I want you to go on to a career 
graduate level school. And Mrs. Thompson, I want you to know, still, you were the best teacher I ever had. And it was signed Teddy Ferguson, MD. Oh. And it was such a powerful thing of how she touched his life because she turned things around in her heart and she reached out and just touched him. And you and I can do that with other people around us. It doesn't have to be a big discourse. It doesn't have to be a sermon. You don't have to take your Bible and sit down and preach to um, Give them a box of cookies. Stop and listen. Show interest. Genuine interest. People can tell. And how we can touch the world for Christ as we do that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and grace and mercy. Thank you for the opportunities just to reach out and touch others and show genuine interest. Maybe sit down and just listen carefully. Listen to a heart, a heart that might have a tear on it. And just be there for people. And be there for the cause of Christ. For we thank you and praise you for we pray in our precious Lord's name. Thank you for this day. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to sing together. May the Lord bless you this week here this day.